Alhamdulillah, we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by sending the best of salutations, peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before I begin, let me ask you whether you'd rather have me stand up and deliver the sermon or remain seated. Sorry? Anything is fine? I usually stay standing. For some odd reason, I decided to sit down today. So you tell me. Sitting is fine. It seems like there's only two people here. Because only two people spoke up. Sitting is okay or? Okay. And the reason why I'm sitting down is because uh, Sheikh Umar also sits down. Right? Yeah. Okay, there we go. I have to follow my elders. So we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for all that he has blessed us with. You know, subhanAllah, the blessings of Allah are so great in number and in quality. So in quantity and in quality. SubhanAllah, we have all the health one can hope for and imagine. And then we have the best of it. Look at our sight. Not only are we able to see, but we're able to see picture perfect. Not only are we able to touch, but the sensation that comes along with the feel of a touch. So the quality of the blessings of Allah in themselves are so many. The quality of being able to thank Allah in itself is a blessing. Because if Allah wanted to deprive us from being grateful to Him, He could have done it. All of us here, Alhamdulillah, we came to attend the Jumu'ah lecture and offer the Jumu'ah prayer with the will of Allah, with His permission. And I often say that a million things could go wrong with you, but not one does. A million things could go wrong with you in your plans, but not a single thing does go wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for you your journey, your way of coming and being able to pray Salatul Jumu'ah. How many people are missing their Salatul Jumu'ah? In possibly, if you were to say in millions, that would not be an exaggeration. In millions. And Salatul Jumu'ah, there is a reason and a purpose for why the emphasis and the importance of Jumu'ah Salah has been given in our faith. It's that communal form of worship. That it's the, where the community comes together on each Friday, and Friday being the best day of the week. And when, subhanAllah, we're missing such an obligation of our own faith, then what other obligations do we really have to tend to? So being able to attend and listen to the lecture, meet and greet your you know, fellow Muslim brothers, mashallah, in our faith in Islam, all of these are blessings from Allah. And this weekly 
form of worship in the manner of Jumu'ah is another weekly dose of spirituality. It gives us that extra push that we need to get by the coming week until again Jumu'ah reappears and we try to come and listen to the lecture and hope to take something home with us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings without a doubt we're not able to comprehend, think or count. They're just far too many. And then each blessing in itself varies by its quality. SubhanAllah. Us having the ability to, you know, mashallah, smile even, to, to walk, to, to enjoy life in itself. So now, more or less, SubhanAllah, in terms of the current year that we're in, 2023, I was thinking about exactly what to talk about, and my previous lectures have been based upon the signs of the hour, alhamatu sa'a, ashratu sa'a, the signs of the hour, or the signs that would appear before the day of judgment's reckoning. Time. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned that the speed, the pace of time will increase, it will speed up. That to us, you know, a, a week would go by like a day, a month would go by like a week, a year would go by like a month. And this is exactly what's happening in our own time, you know, in, our, in our own era, in the life that we've been blessed with. How many of us may still remember the year 2000? And now we're in 2023. So the question is, what's going to be different about this year than the previous years? And only you have the answer to it. What difference will this year make, subhanAllah, in our life? in the lives of our children, in the lives of our families, our relatives, our friends, within our social circle. You and Allah know best. And the prophecy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that as we draw closer to the Day of Judgment, Islam will become a stranger. People who practice the faith of Islam will become strangers. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned this within the narration that بَدَلْ إِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ فَتُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاءِ وَكُمَا قَالَ سَلَاتُ وَالسَّلَامُ That Islam started off as a, as a strange religion. And in time, it will go back to being a strange religion. And understand the meaning, the definition of strange. Think about it for a moment. What does strange mean? Something odd? Something out of place? Something which you can't identify? You can't recognize? You're not sure about? You don't know what or who? They may be, subhanAllah. That's what a stranger is. You come across a stranger you've never seen before. You'll wonder, who is this man? Where, where did he come from? And why has he approached me? Why is he coming so close to me? What business do I have with him? Like, who is this stranger? No one knows him. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioning that Islam, this faith of Islam will go on in becoming a strange thing. And it people who follow it will become strangers themselves. In other words, just as how a stranger does not have friends, a stranger does not have resources, a stranger who's traveling becomes a stranger. He's away from his possessions. He's away from any influence that he could possibly have to his disposal. Those who would act upon Islam will become strangers. You'll lose your friends. You'll lose your influence. You may even lose your wealth. You may lose your status. And you will go on in becoming a stranger. Why? Because you decided to and you chose to remain and continue to act upon our faith Islam by simply offering salah, by simply telling people about the good and preventing them and in trying to forbid them from evil. That was your price. That was more or less your crime that now you've been labeled a stranger. How strange is it that when a person starts to offer their daily salah, all of a sudden he becomes distant from his other circles. People start to label and say, oh, he's become too religious. This man has become way too religious. He's, he's way above and beyond than us. I don't think he fits in. He's, he doesn't belong with us. How many times, subhanAllah, is it that you would have to make a choice whether to attend an event or not because you would disagree and disapprove of what may happen in that event? 
So on religious grounds, you'll choose not to go. And when your presence, when your presence is noticed that you're absent, your absence is noticed, by default, people will know, oh, I know why he didn't come, because he wouldn't approve of what we're about to do. The one who didn't appear, the one who chose to remain absent, and those who attend, they're both Muslims. The one who's offering salah and the one who isn't, subhanAllah, seemingly both, both of them are Muslims. But yet one becomes an outcast. One becomes a stranger and the other, subhanAllah, is given what? A lofty status, position, respect, honor, and anything a person can hope for. A well-known individual. Here we're reminded, Allah states in the Quran, do not judge the success of this world based upon your perception or based upon the criteria of people around you. Just because people may think you're a successful man doesn't guarantee that you're a successful man. Just if assumingly people label that you're, you know, one in a million, it doesn't necessarily mean you truly are one in a million. Why? Because our criteria and standard of being successful and possibly one in a million should be based upon the standards of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It should be based upon Quran and Sunnah. It should be based upon the pleasure and the displeasure of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we need to learn to start living our lives based upon what Allah likes and what He dislikes. And what our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us about the things he likes and the things we should refrain from. And when we start to live you know, on such principles and guidelines, then without a doubt, guarantee you truly are a successful person. You truly will be a successful individual, both in this world as well as the hereafter. Because it is Allah wa tu'izu man tasha, he is the one who gives respect and honor to whomever he wills. And then he is the one what to dhillu man tasha, disgraces whomever he wills. And Allah mentions, look, subhanAllah, all of us, we have a goal in life. We have this vision. We have these dreams, more or less. We're focused. We want to be somewhere. We want to be someone. We want to make a comfortable means of living and earning. We want to do what we like. We want to follow our desires to the furthest we possibly can. And in that, we strive to do what must be done. Whether it requires me to wake up 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, before dawn even, subhanAllah, the sun hasn't even risen. If it requires for me to wake up at that time, I will. Because I know what I'm out for, what I must achieve. Now, the same goes for our children. We know the importance of education. So that is why we'll do our best in making sure they don't miss a day of school while school is in session. Because if they do, seemingly they'll miss out on what's taught on that day and they'll be left behind. Right? So for the sake of school, for the sake of education, ultimately for the sake of their future, we'll make sure they're up before school begins. We'll make sure that they're up and ready ready to go, catch the bus, or be dropped off before school starts, before the bell rings. SubhanAllah, and we have the right, more or less, to assume that way, that education brings empowerment. Education, you know, more or less, will shape an individual's future. And we do the best that we can, and no harm in that. But have we ever thought that my child's success, it really, truly and really rests in his Fajr Salah. So I need to wake him up for Salat al-Fajr. But most of the time, more or less, majority of the parents don't even think about Fajr, but they'll be very conscious and mindful of school hours. Now this is an extreme side of things, SubhanAllah, that you're giving such importance to something which you assume to be of much value and yet you don't mind to look after the importance and the value Allah has placed in Fajr Salah for your child and I mean 
not your preschooler or your elementary child. We're talking about high schoolers. We're talking about college level, university students. We're not talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kids waking them up for fajr. If you want, bismillah, and this is how they'll develop love for salah. But we're talking about mature, grown men and women. You're still your children. Someone can be 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. You'll still address them as your child. And more or less, subhanallah, nowadays parents have more or less settled. They've bargained. That's maybe a more of an appropriate word to use. They've made a deal with their children. Look, child, look, son, daughter. At least pray Juma. At least come with me and pray Juma Salah. That's it. And if someone has gone beyond that, okay, it's Eid. Uh, we gotta go together as a family. Salatul Juma has the same importance as Salatul Fajr. Right? Salatul Juma has the same importance as any other Salah during the day. But why is it that we're not giving that? Amal, that ibadah, such attention that it deserves. And then, subhanAllah, when a person becomes a regular attendee for salah, becomes a stranger. Oh, he's become way too religious for us. Well, are you not a Muslim? I mean, whatever Allah is requiring from him, is he not asking of you as well? And the thing about salah, Muhammad wasallam is mentioned, it is what holds a person between iman and kufr. It is what keeps you tied between Iman and Kufr, more or less. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرَ If someone lets go of Salah, then they'll fall into disbelief. And it's a matter of time until we see the results. How many of our own children, and may Allah protect and preserve their Iman, are hesitant to come to Salah with their parents? They're hesitant and they'll shy away to come and attend the Jumu'ah Salah with their parents. And subhanAllah, <coughs> how many families do we know? We don't need to give examples. But nowadays, parents, look, winter break just came to an end, last week or so. How many parents went on a road trip? How many parents roamed the country, went out of state, went to a different country for a vacation purpose? But the purpose in itself wasn't really to go and have a good time. It was so that they could finally be in one car for hours of drive with their kids. Because where is the child going to go if he knows that I'm stuck with my mom and dad for the next 10 hours of drive time? I can't make an excuse to leave. I can't make an excuse to distract myself or to get away from my parents. I'm here with them and I'm going to be with them. So parents are resorting to you know, that kind of an excuse of spending time with their kids, son, daughter, let's go on a vacation together. Let's go on a road trip. Let's go out of state. And the child may be very excited to hear and know, oh, sure, why not? But in reality, the parent, mom and dad only want to spend more time with their kids. And once the child buckles up and is in the car, you know, more or less, again, your middle schooler, your high schooler, your college level, once they get to high school and college, they won't even go on a road trip with you. Because now they're too grown up for a road trip with their parents, mashallah. But for the, with their friends, by all means, let's roam the world together. So my message to some of the parents, mashallah, we're blessed with children. Be a parent. Allah has blessed you to be a parent of your child. But also learn to be their friends. So that you can manage the gap that children feel. And it's not your fault to some degree, and it's not theirs either. It's just the way things are going and the, the, the direction we're going towards, which is of course the day of judgment, that all these signs are becoming prevalent. All of these signs are becoming more obvious and apparent to us. Whether we accept them, whether we recognize them or not, they're there. And SubhanAllah, a sign of the day of judgment that a child, again, I keep saying child, but a person, will give preference to his friends over his parents. A person will give preference to her friends over her parents. Don't we see that? Of course we do. But we just won't admit it in the public. 
so that my child will continue to have that level of respect that he or she enjoy. And they'll continue to be known as very respectable children in the community. Or they'll, conti they'll continue to be known as the angels they are. This is something we should really sit down and think about. That how is it that we can spend more time with our kids, with our grown-up kids, and what is it that we need to do? The first thing, start emphasizing upon the importance of salah. The importance of salah. If you can wake up for school, you can definitely wake up for fajr. If you can wake up for your work, you can definitely wake up for your fajr. I often say, if you can wake up for your work, then you can definitely wake up for the one who's given you the work. Make sense? You know, subhanAllah, these are very common, sensible things that anyone can understand and, and follow. Because Islam is easy, it's not difficult. We made it difficult. How? By labeling those who adhere to Islam as strangers and us to be progressives, us to be, mashallah, the new shining light of the era, the ideal role models to be followed. Because, hey, you know, you only live once. All of these things should be considered and counted for. Why? Not only does our life depend upon it, but our iman depends upon it. Not only the life of our children, but their iman as well. There's much to say. Subhanallah. But I'll end it here, inshallah. Hopefully next time I see all of you, mashallah, in beautiful numbers. I make this request one time to those who are present. I know we're supposed to start uh, with salah soon. Think of it this way, guys. Your Friday lecture is your spiritual lifeline now. Your Friday khutbah lecture reminder is your spiritual lifeline. Try your best to attend. Wherever you may be, whichever community, Woodbridge, Manassas, Springfield, Exam, wherever you may be, don't just come rush for salah when the iqama is read and called. Come before the imam even appears so that you can listen to what he has to say and then share the message on with others and of course ultimately implement it in yourself within your own household. Why? Because if you don't get this dose of a friendly reminder, you'll get reality come at you and hit you hard. And then you'll want to talk to the Imam. And then you'll want to run to the masjid and ask the Shaykh or the Khatib for a solution to the problems you're facing. So awareness is empowerment. This is what education is about. So mashallah, all of you who are present, try to come inshallah, try to come before you know, any of the speakers appear. So that mashallah, with your barakah, with the wellness and the khayr that you bring into the hall, inshallah, there will be some khayr coming from the speaker as well. Because think of it, Muhammad Sallallahu has mentioned that every believer, every Muslim has khayr in them. And imagine when there are more in numbers, there's more in khayr. And we want all the khayr we can get. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the right understanding of his deen. Rabbana taqabal minna inna kanta s-sameer alim. Wa tuba alayna inna kanta tawab al-rahim. Wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala ala khayri khalqi. Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahim.